Good morning and welcome to this act of worship for Pentecost Sunday, the 23rd of May. Jesus breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. On this day of Pentecost, we declare together in gladness and in one voice, The Lord is here, his Spirit is with us. The peace of the Lord be always with you, I greet you in his name. So let us pray. Through time, across continents, soaring over creation, God's Spirit is speaking. Whispering and comforting, roaring and challenging, God's Spirit surrounds us. Beyond touch, warmly embracing, God's Spirit transforms us, making our horizons wider, our faith stronger, our hopes possible. Creator God, like a bird you hovered over the chaos of the world's first day, drawing life from crashing waves and making a world of possibility. You hovered still over parting waters, liberating an enslaved people, guiding them forward with cloud and fire, nurturing your followers and sharing your love. Like a still small voice, you made your presence felt to prophets and healers, to a people in exile and young mothers-to-be. In the life of Jesus, your healing touch was felt and all were made welcome. Like flickering embers dancing into flame, you revived those who looked for you, inspiring their speech and startling onlookers. Undeterred by death, you delivered creative power, transforming determination and your eternal supporting presence. And your spirit nurtures us still, a gathered people at Pentecost, moved to celebrate, free to be ourselves, and open ourselves to you and to the world around us. Blow among us, Spirit of God, fill us with your courage and care. Hurricane and breath, take us on a journey of love. And so we come to our prayers of confession. Let us be still for a moment. Our God, we come before you in humility, confessing who and what we are. We are often unresponsive, for we are afraid. When your spirit speaks, we can turn deaf ears, for we fear what you might call us to do. When your spirit touches our lips, we can be guilty of closing our mouths, embarrassed to speak your word. When the wind of your spirit blows, we can close the windows of our hearts, afraid that the breeze will disrupt our ordered lives. When the fire of your spirit touches us, we can quench that flame, afraid of the new life it might bring. In the power of your loving, healing, restoring and forgiving spirit, forgive us, O Lord. Spirit of the living God, move among us, transform us into the people you invite us to be. Transform the world into the place you dream it to be. Make us one in love, humble, caring, selfless, sharing. Amen. Unsurprisingly, our reading for this morning is from Acts chapter 2, beginning at verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as of fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. Now there were devout Jews from every nation under heaven living in Jerusalem, and at this sound the crowd gathered and was bewildered because each one heard them speaking in the native language of each. Amazed and astonished, they asked, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear, each of us, in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, 
and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs. In our own languages, we hear them speaking about God's deeds of power. All were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others sneered and said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, raised his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you, and listen to what I say. Indeed, these are not drunk, as you suppose, for it is only nine o'clock in the morning. No, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. In the last days it will be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even upon my slaves, both men and women, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show portents in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and smoky mist. The sun shall be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the coming of the Lord's great and glorious day. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Thanks be to God for his word, and may he add his blessing and understanding to it. In order that. Three simple short words that when combined and joined together in that order, form a powerful and profound sentence. A sentence that is found at the heart of all that we are as Christians, disciples and churches, and one that is to be found at the centre of all that we are celebrating today. Today is of course Pentecost, when we celebrate the pouring out of the Holy Spirit upon the disciples, and it's also Aldersgate Sunday, reminding us that 283 years ago tomorrow evening, John Wesley experienced his heart of being strangely warmed, and at long last he found what he'd been searching for. He wrote, In the evening I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street, where one was reading Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation, and an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. As I've written and said elsewhere, the focus of both these events, Aldersgate and Pentecost, are those divine moments when the moving of God's Spirit brings a transformational experience from which the message of God's love for all goes forth into the world to dramatic effect. From the tongues of fire resting on those scared and frightened disciples to John Wesley's warmth out, the change was profound. The reluctant John Wesley now found he had the assurance he so craved, and those disciples were emboldened to leave the safety and sanctuary of that room. As individuals and as churches, Pentecost and Aldersgate remind us of our heritage and history and remind us to continue to allow God's Spirit to move in and through us. Pentecost and Aldersgate are often seen as the birthdays of the Church and of the Methodist movement, and they give us both time and space to reflect on what it means to be a follower of Jesus today from within a Methodist perspective. This question is perhaps even more pertinent this year as we begin to cautiously emerge out of lockdown and into the brightness of the outside world, as we look upon a different landscape that is at once both oddly familiar, whilst at the same time being new. In order that. Those three simple short words remind us that both Pentecost and Aldersgate are not ends in themselves, and were never intended to be so, but are examples of God's power breaking into our world, of God's gifts given to his people, which are to be used for the sake of everyone, for the benefit of others. Pentecost and Aldersgate were never meant to be internal, private and exclusive events, just and solely for the privileged, for the few, or for those in the know, but rather occasions for all of humanity. 
from the tongues of fire, the roaring wind and the warmed heart sprang the transformational power of God resting on those he chose in order that, in order that the world might know him and be changed from glory into glory. And that, of course, is as true today as it was on May the 24th, 1738, and in those events in Jerusalem way back in the day. So what does all that mean for us? Well, exactly the same, it has to be said. For today we claim the power of Pentecost and Aldersgate for ourselves in order that we may be transformational agents of God in the world and so that all people would know and experience his love and grace. We are to continue to serve the present age our calling to fulfil, to quote from John's somewhat overshadowed brother Charles. So through the events of Pentecost and Aldersgate, what kind of people, what kind of church does God want us to be in this third decade of the 21st century? Quite simply, I suggest we are called to be an in order that people and an in order that church. A people and a church who are warm hearted, inclusive and inviting, connected and committed, engaged and involved, to be found with those on the marginalised and on the edges, in order that we can make a difference. Of course, these are not new qualities, but qualities and priorities that are to be found in the life preaching example of Wesley and in the early days of Methodism. It's interesting that if we look back to our heritage, if we uncover our roots, we find we rediscover what we are all about. And what we find is not backward looking at all, but future shaped. And we discover what we need to help and serve our present age. We find what we need for the here and now. Methodism has always been about in order that. In the words of Martin Atkins from a few years ago, when he was uh, the General Secretary of the Methodist Church, we need to rediscover that as Methodists we are open and inclusive, prophetic, but not otherworldly, instinctively evangelical, but not fundamentalist, inherently radical, but not anarchic, holding together a Christianity that is both personal and social, committed to working with others and committed to being connected. We see that 21st century Methodism is about being a missionary movement, Christ offering in disciple making, spirit empowered, holy and involved, and a movement with dirt under its fingernails. In rediscovering the past, we find our future. We find what we have to offer. We find our distinctive voice and our own unique contribution to bring to the ecumenical party and table as we seek to work in partnership with others. These, of course, are the sentiments behind a Methodist way of life, for it's not a checklist of things that we must do in order to be good followers or Methodists, far from it. Rather, it's an intentional opportunity to participate in a rhythm and way of life that encourages all to respond to God's love, and in doing so to live and express that in the life of the church and of the world. A Methodist way of life is not compulsory, nor is it mandatory but simply an invitation. And like so much of life and faith, <clears throat> it's down to each individual as to how we respond. So in worship, we are encouraged to pray daily, worship with others regularly, look and listen for God in scripture and in the world. In learning and caring, we are encouraged to care for ourselves and for those around us, learn more about our faith and practice hospitality and generosity. In service, we are encouraged to help people in our communities and beyond, care for creation and all God's gifts, and to challenge injustice. In evangelism, we are encouraged to speak of the love of God, live in a way that draws others to Jesus and share our faith with others. Why is this important? Why is this being seen as such a priority by the Methodist Connection and our district? The answer is quite simple. And it's found in those three simple, short words. In order that. In order that we might be a blessing within and beyond God's church. In order that we might be a blessing 
for the transformation of the world. I once again commend a Methodist way of life to you as we reflect on what it means to be followers of Jesus this Pentecost and Aldersgate Sunday. And may we have the courage to move forward in faith and to be a people raised up by God in order that he might work through us to change the world. Amen. So let us pray. Loving God, on all those who are sick in body, mind and spirit, O living God, have mercy. On those who are lonely or afraid, on those who suffer from anxiety or whose souls are discomforted and troubled, O living God, have mercy. On all those whose lives are dedicated to service, our NHR, NHS staff, the hospitality industry, our farmers and many others, O living God, have mercy. On those who are never able to attend their place of worship, who suffer persecution and oppression and live in deprivation, O living God, have mercy. On those who fear they are unworthy and unwelcome in church, who do not feel included in your kingdom, O living God, have mercy. On those who do not know your peace for whatever reason, O living God, have mercy. In the silence of our worship together, we hold before God our own prayers and our own concerns at this time. O living God, have mercy. Everlasting God, whose very nature is love that has no end, hear our prayers. Help us to never make you in our own image, but remain in awe of your mystery, the God who was, who is, and who will always be. In the name of Christ, who shows us how to love. Amen. And we say together, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. May God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit, Creator, Redeemer and Sustainer, go with us now. May God's Spirit be on us, on those we love, and on those for whom we should pray this Pentecost day and always. <laughs>